thanks for coming today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about using games and game-based simulations for assessment. And we do this across different industries, but I brought together four different um, assessments that we've used for different medical professionals to share with you today. And really, I'm not here to talk about games to educate or assess the public on their medical needs, on how to comply with their medical treatments. We're really talking about how we target training needs of physicians, nurses, allied health professionals. Now, games have been used for over a decade for training in this space, but really only over the past couple years have we seen this shift to using games to meet skill assessment, continuing competency, and professional credentialing needs. So in this presentation, I just want to focus you, I'm going to quickly show you some demos of four different um, game-based assessments that we're using that target medical professionals. And hopefully in the quick preview I can give you of each of them, you'll get a good enough sense of what these games look like. So before we start, one of the things I always like to do to frame my talks is to remind people that games aren't real. And in this audience, that probably doesn't need to be said. Um, but in entertainment, as an entertainment game development company, we strove for authenticity in our games, not realism. So you strive for it feeling authentic, but it doesn't actually have to be real. And what we find is when we go out and work with customers with real world needs, they come to us and say things like, wow, that first person shooter looks so real. You know, I saw my son playing it and it looks so real. So we want the, that realism brought to our training or our assessment. And the first thing that scares me about that is that we don't have the AAA budgets that those organizations have to build those AAA real looking games. And even they aren't real. They're authentic, but they're not real. So we need to get our customers to look beyond the graphics and really focus on the authenticity of the experience. We're talking about providing cognitive fidelity to really fuel the decision making, look at cognitive skills, and assess those underlying skills. So this is a slide with lots of words. I don't normally use these. Um, if you know nothing about assessment and you don't want to listen to me, if you are, are more comfortable reading, um, I stole some lovely definitions from Wikipedia. But I'm going to give you a bottom line up front. Um, so people assess for lots of reasons, right? So some of those reasons are to provide insight into the learning process, provide immediate feedback to a learner, indicate any skill gaps, or look for areas of potential further instruction, right? So formative assessment focuses on informing and focusing your teaching. Then we can move a little bit further down the line of training, and we want to assess to measure outcomes, knowledge levels, attainment of specific levels of proficiency, and that's where we talk about summative assessment, where you focus on educational outcomes. Finally, we talk about where we want to provide some sort of a record of behavior. We want to demonstrate someone's expertise in an area. We want to really be sure that they've got certain knowledge or skills that they've acquired. We want to certify proficiency. And that's where we start to see more standardized assessments that focus on competency and credentialing come into play. So why did I bother setting up the definitions of what assessment are and the different ways that we use them? The most awesome things about games is that they just naturally, formatively assess. If you play entertainment games, the way they work is that you're constantly being challenged. You may fall, you may fail, but then you get up and you learn a little bit more and it gets a little bit harder and it gets a little bit harder and that's sort of perfect learning, right? So everybody says games are perfect for assessment because they are these great formative assessment engines. That's fabulous, but that's not how the assessment community and the credentialing community talk about assessment, right? So, here we've got a little bit more of a problematic relationship where there's very little tolerance for feedback being provided during an assessment. There's very little tolerance for sort of reattempting a skill once you fail. They don't want variability in performance environments. They've really got high stakes. If you're going to determine whether someone can actually go out and practice medicine based on an assessment, that's high stakes. That's someone's career on the line. It's also the people they're going to treat in the future's lives on the line. So they've got this high stakes need to really get control of their assessments. And one of the things that I'm going to show you today is that that often means that we kind of break games to use them as assessments. In some cases, they turn more into simulations than we'd like. So they're sort of a gamified simulation. Um, but 
we're starting to see this trend towards redefining and expanding the notions of what we can do with games for assessment. Looking at different skills that we've never been able to assess before. Looking at new definitions of success. I mean, I'd like to know how my future employees are going to recover from failure. We're all going to fail at some point. How do you handle it when you do? We don't typically measure those sorts of things very well. But regardless, for today's current needs and definitions, using games for assessment generally requires us to break games. I'm going to show you a couple today that we've broken, and I think in epic ways. Um, but the awesome thing is that they're allowing us now, today, to assess skills in more meaningful ways than were ever possible previously. So to jump right in, my first example is going to use a vHealthcare platform. All of the games I'm showing you today were created by my company um, in partnership with other organizations. So I'll tell you for each game who that organization is and what they're doing with it. So this is a platform. We've built probably 50 different training and assessment tools using it. Today I'm going to specifically talk about a product called Pediatric Sim. It was funded by the Office of Naval Research. Um, and Jim Girard at St. Louis University Hospital and Medical School is researching the use of this tool. It actually teaches, or assesses, I'm sorry, people's performance on the American Heart Association's Pediatric Advanced Life Support Protocol. The goal when you're playing this game is to stabilize each patient that you encounter by providing appropriate treatments. Each patient has a real underlying physiology model that's been simulated, so they respond to the things that you do or fail to do. Um, and really, when physicians are using this tool, they really do seem to be experiencing the real world pressures of their job. All right, here's the magic moment. We're going to launch our first video. So just to give you a quick introduction here, in the game that you're about to see, performance measured by comparing in-game performance to an ideal performance. There's no specific script, and there is an after-action review that's going to be generated and is output that's sent to the researchers or the people assessing these individuals. For the player, the real feedback they get is going to be the condition Jimmy of the player. Been having trouble breathing today. He has a bad cough and seems so congested. Can you tell me what's wrong? Not to worry. Please take a seat over there, and we'll assess his condition. So here you see an idea of what it looks like to interact with contextually you know, linked menus, to interact with the patient themselves, to interact with other medical professionals Excuse me, in the room. We've used this type of simulation from the perspective of everyone in the allied health team. And in a minute, you'll see some equipment being used and introduced. The pixelation you're seeing is the video quality, not the game quality. I'm going to attach cardiac monitor. You can, you know, interact with the equipment. And this is really, I think, what represents standard. Most of the applications we're seeing in the medical space today for either game-based training or assessment. It's this 3D interaction with the patient. Okay. So. Extremities are warm. Cap refill is two seconds. So what we found here is um, Jim Gerard actually did the research and found that this game has high discriminant ability. So how many people in here are sort of stats junkies? OK, a couple of you. I'm going to give real layman's terms of what the stats mean. There are published research studies, so it's not dumbed down stats, but it's just to make it easy to understand. OK, so we can tell whether you are a medical resident, a subspecialty attending, or a medical student based on your performance in the game. We can discriminate using the game. Further, we can actually correlate your scores on this game with your written test scores on the PALS process. So those are really nice <laughs> metrics that show, and, and they are statistically valid. I've got great like error bars that I could show you. I'm a chart junkie too, but I didn't bring them in today, but they are all in the paper. But I want to contrast this with a completely different type of assessment game, again, for medical professions. So here we're looking at a game called Vital Signs. This is a game that was created to assess the emergency department physician's skills at making decisions. Specifically with the pediatric version, we're looking at multi-patient management skills. So how do you manage the many patients that come into your emergency department, triage them, determine how to treat them, how do you split your attention across these groups? Um, the National Board of Medical Examiners Stemler grant actually funded the development of 64 real, anonymized, of course, 
uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles cases that came into their emergency department. We created a series of 15-minute games that require management of three to five patients, depending on the complexity of the cases. And they're using this platform to research those multi-patient management skills in their residents. And really the goal, it's terrifying to me to think about this, but the way we currently measure multi-patient management skills is we look at how many patients per hour um, do you treat. And that really lacks so much richness in what we could know about what types of patients, you know, were they clinically in worse situation or less situation, you know, it, it's just really scary to me. So I'm going to go ahead and launch our second video, and my monitor's gone to sleep, so I'm going to try to do it up here. All right, so here what you'll see is as the um, game loads, across the bottom of the screen you see a series of boxes. They've got some people in them and some question marks. Those are your exam rooms. Those are the patients that have been placed into those rooms waiting for you. Very simple interface here. We took out the 3D. We're not, you know, interacting with each part of the patient's body. If I want to examine this patient, I click on that paper doll you see up at the top of the screen um, with the highlighted red head and arms. And I just click on the parts of the body I want to receive feedback about, and it gives me the assessment of whatever tests you would have performed. I've got a full case presentation. I do have a dynamic but more simplified physiology model running in the background, so their vitals are updating in real time based upon their treatment or lack thereof. And you can see here how there's sort of an electronic medical record that allows them to interact with all the information about the patient, um, request orders. Here you see the paper doll that I was talking about. And they're just asked to go through and manage all of these different patients. So Dr. Chang, Todd Chang at the USC Keck School for Medicine and Children's Hospital of Los Angeles was interested in researching the validity of a 2D game to evaluate these multi-patient management skills. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about discriminant validity. So he actually was able to demonstrate that there were significant differences in people's approach to multi-patient care based on whether they were you know, early providers or expert providers working in this space. Um, but more interestingly, with NBME as his sponsor, he actually was able to get access to five of the standard metrics they use to assess um, physician skills related to multi-patient management and assessment. Um, and he was able to show that he had convergent validity with all five of those real tests that people had taken who participated in his study. Um, so I think that's amazing. We've got now these two studies. Now, one of the things he's really interested in doing is taking the output data from this. So we've now sort of demonstrated that we can discriminate, that we can find data that aligns with the other more traditional metrics. But what he's really interested in doing now is extrapolating and looking at all that data to actually figure out what is it that those experts are doing differently than the novices. Because believe it or not, they don't know. And they're hoping that they can actually study the data of lots of people going through and playing this to figure out how we can create training protocols to better train our residents to become experts more quickly. All right, now for something completely and totally different. Um, this astonishes me every time I read it. The, uh, in the United States, adequate diagnostic interview and physical exam skills are the number one and two sources of indemnity payout. So that means malpractice, right? <laughs> so when something happens to someone, those are the two largest causes. And they seem so easy to address based on all the really complex skills that, that we need physicians and allied support staff to learn. So. The USC Standardized Patient Studio, and that is USC, the University of Southern California, was created to provide standardized, repeatable, virtual, emotionally expressive, standard patient encounters. And they were focused on medical diagnostic skills and interview training. They don't want to bring in live actors, and they don't want to use recorded video for evaluation. So if you're a Seinfeld fan from back in the day, Kramer was one of these standardized patients. You know, they train real people to come in and exhibit the symptoms of an illness. And then they record that whole interaction, and people then score those videos of you interacting with the patient to determine what your skills are like. It's a very costly process, and the ability to offer that type of training and assessment is limited. So in an application like this, we can move to standardize it. Um, we've actually open sourced this so people can even create their own cases using the standard patient tools. So the Defense Medical Research Development Program actually funded the development of a tool set 
that allows us to simulate patient interactions with performance measurement, formative guidance provided. It allows spoken or typed interviews. They have branching encounters. There's a lot of diagnostic tests and assessment built in. And it's got a tool set that actually allows authoring of these patients. When they first started working on standardized patients, it took them about six months to author one of these guys. Now it's less than a day with no coding. So I'll jump in very quickly, show you a brief little overview of what some of this looks like. Magic happens here. Hello. Hello, doctor. I'm Dr. Cole. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. What brings you in today? My ear really hurts. That's why I'm here. Tell me more. Well, it started about three days ago and was just irritating. At first I thought it would pass on its own, but the ear pain just kept increasing. That's when I started taking Martran. Okay, so that gives you an overview of what it looks like to use one of these things. Um, they basically showed that after just 20 minutes of use, they had 68% performance gains um, in these medical interview skills, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, they had 92% recognition and 96% accuracy for medical natural language, which is also phenomenal. But I think most amazing of all is that that automatic medical performance assessment, those intelligent guys running in the background assessing, were accurate within 5% of the live evaluators from recorded video. So I think that's where the real power of this technology came into play. So, so far we've seen games used to target assessment of unique, specific skills. A lot of them are being used in the laboratory. All of the games that I'm showing you are actually award-winning games. Uh, but the next game, uh, series of games that I want to talk about very briefly is the MBCOT Navigator. And this is actually a continuing competency platform that was created for the National Board for the Certification of Occupational Therapy. This sucker's got like hundreds of interactions built into it. It's got a portal that launches all of these assessments. Um, and this is how people are renewing their certifications. They actually learn about client-centered care, working in interprofessional teams, consuming evidence-based practice, um, employing quality improvement. There's just so much built into it, I couldn't possibly show it all to you today. But this has been live for about three years now. They've got hundreds and thousands of uses. They've got people recertifying re using the platform. Um, so there's just some amazing stuff going on where we're now using these games and simulations outside of the lab for real world populations. Um, I have just a minute. I know we run directly into the next session, but I'm happy to take any questions and I'm always happy to talk to people outside of the session. No, so all of these are screen based, so they're all being used web deployable. Mm -hmm. So, one of the key things to using PET to deal with is variability across patients, and patients can have the same underlying pathophysiology, but variable expression, and they have to learn what's inbound, what's out of bounds, when do they change their mind about mm -hmm. what's going on. Do you represent that kind of variability? Um, yes, so it all depends on who our partner is and how deep they want to go into it. And it depends if it's open sourced and what the community provides. But that's absolutely the intention. Um, originally, that be healthcare platform was created to enable people to represent that broad variability and create a standardized residency program. Mm 